Amen. Praise the Lord. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Amen. We're just listening to a song. Ain't nothing like a gospel song. I don't know if that was a gospel song. But, <laughs> amen. But a song with the gospel message in it. Amen. It stirs your soul. It, 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 it pulls you out of the doldrums of life and, and reminds you of the goodness of the Lord. Praise the Lord. It's good to be back in the city of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Amen. Amen. Thank you for all your prayers and standing in the gap. And, and thank you, Evangelist Gladden, for filling in. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. We had a little technical difficulties, but it's up there on YouTube, so I encourage you to go watch it. I only got about halfway through myself, but it was good what I heard. Amen. Amen. And, and, and uh, the Lord will do you good. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Uh, I got a call this week while I was away. I was in Miami. And they said, Pastor, the church was packed out. I said, wow, that's great. I need to stay away. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. I guess they got all tuckered out last week uh, and just set their spirits today. Uh, Amen. But thank God for those of you that are here. And we thank God for Sister Valerie. Amen. 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 Worship her in Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Welcome you guys back home. Uh, <laughs> oh, thank you. That's the welcome committee. The welcome committee. Amen. Yes. And for all of you that are watching on YouTube later on, we thank God for you. Uh, I had a few weeks back started a, a, a series, which was supposed to be a three-part series, but I have been fighting and struggling with getting the third part out and uh, been wrestling with it pretty much all week and turning it over my I just don't feel like uh, it's time to release that one. So so okay, God, what should we talk about? And I believe the Lord has uh, just laid a little something on uh, my heart today. We're just, we're going to take it easy on you today. We're going to take it kind of light. We're just going to do some reading of the Word of God to encourage you and then let you enjoy uh, this not so hot day of summer here in the city. <coughs> Amen. 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 We'll be coming from Isaiah 51. We'll be starting at the ninth verse. And I just want to entitle this message, this talk. I really believe this is the word of the Lord. Wake up, Philadelphia. Wake up, America. Amen. We're starting at Isaiah. Chapter 59, beginning at the, uh, 51, beginning at the ninth verse. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. Wake up. Wake up, O Lord. Clothe yourself with strength. Flex your mighty arm. Rouse yourself as in the days of old when you slew Egypt and the dragon of the Nile. Are you not the same today and the one who dried up the sea, making a path of escape through the depths so that your people could cross over? Those who have been ransomed by the Lord will return. They will enter Jerusalem singing, crowned with everlasting joy. Sorrow and mourning will disappear, and they will be filled with joy and gladness. So this is the people of God praying, God, are you asleep? Do you see what's going on here? And we could be making that same kind of prayer today. God, do you see what's happening to our country? Do you see what's happening to our city? Uh, there's a lot of things we'd like to be number one in, but killing is not what we want to be number one in. God, do you see what's going on here? And so they, they, so they're as if we have to wake God up. And, and then they go on to remind God what we do in our prayer. God, those folks back then, you delivered them. And that's what they were doing. You reminded, you, you, you redeemed, you saved uh, our forefathers from the, the Red Sea when they were being chased by the Egyptians. You blessed them over there. And then they sort of close out this prayer by making de declarations of what they want. Those who have been ransomed by the Lord will return. God, if you deliver us, we will be delivered. And we'll enter back into our city with singing and with crown with everlasting joy and sorrow and mourning will disappear. All of this sadness that we're so upset about, it'll all be a, as a memory to us. And that's what they're declaring as they pray to God. But now this is God's response, picking up in verse 12. 
I, yes, I am the one who comforts you. Yeah, you got that right. You're the, I'm the one you should be calling on when you're in distress, when you're in trouble, when you have a need. I'm the one. So why are you afraid of mere humans? Now, in the, the series, I was telling you who you are. You're, you're not a human, just a human being anymore, especially by the world's standards, by the world's definition. You are supermen and superwomen and has not yet even entirely been revealed who we are in this world right now. And I've often said DC Comics has nothing on what's about to be released in the church. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about Superman and Wonder Woman, you ain't seen nothing yet. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So why are you afraid of mere humans who wither like grass and disappear? Yet you have forgotten the Lord, your creator, the one who stretched out the sky like a canopy and laid the foundations of the earth. Will you remain in constant dread of human oppressors? Will you continue to fear the anger of your enemies? Where is their fury and anger now? It's, it is gone. I've often reminded us in almost every service, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he is a brand new creature. In other words, you're no longer a human being, uh, but you're a brand new creature. Old things, your old weaknesses, your old mess-ups, failures, mm -hmm. sins, they're all done away with. And behold, all things are become new. And one of my recent favorite scriptures is what 1 uh, Corinthians just let me. But it says, if any man is, uh, is united with Christ, we are one spirit with the Lord. Yeah. So if we are, I think it's 617, is it? 1 Corinthians 617. If, if we are united with Christ, we are one spirit with the Lord. We are one spirit with the Lord. We still have to let that sink in some more. So I'll, 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 I'll get back to that later on. But verse 14 says, Soon all your captives will be released. Imprisonment, starvation, and death will not be your fate. Some of us need to memorize that and put that in our prayer. God, this is what you said. This is in your word. Our captives will not be released. Some of you have been praying. I know we have a lot of mothers in here who have been praying for their sons and their daughters, their grandchildren, and it seems like those knucklehead, those rebellious children just won't surrender their hearts to God. No matter how hard you preach to them, no matter what you do, no matter how good you tell them God has been to you, they won't come to the Lord, but God says now is the time that those who have been held captive by sin, by shame, by yes. whatever, they're going to be released. Yes. And for those of you that are, are studying the end times and are believing of, uh, about a horrible eschatology, how the beasts and the antichrist are going to take over the world, God says, listen, imprisonment, starvation, or death is not in your future. Amen. God is saying there is going to be a glorious eschatology. There's going to be a glorious end time for my people. Amen. God says, I'm coming looking for a bride, not who's weak, hiding out in a cave, as I say, trying to figure out what to do with dehydrated water, but he's looking for a bride who is powerful and is equal to his son, Jesus Christ. And we are that bride. We are, we, the people of God, we are the church. We are the bride of Christ that God is looking for, and he's going to uh, show his power. He's going to show himself strong in us and through us and to the eyes of the world. So I'm going to read 14 again. Soon all of your captives will be released. Oh, yeah. We know that verse in, 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 uh, that Paul writes, he says, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved and thy house. Yeah. If you believe, you're going to be saved and your household will be saved. Yeah. Just keep telling God you said because I believe. Yeah. Not because they believe. Yeah. They're going to be saved. Yes. Thank yeah. you, Jesus. God says your captives will be released. Yeah. And imprisonment is not in your future. Yeah. Starvation is not in your future. You're going to be fat and flourishing. Look at me. My butt and my buttonhole are trying to practice uh, social distancing. Right? Because of this COVID-19 pounds I've been putting on. Yeah. It's the blessings of the Lord. My ministry is increasing. 
<laughs> Verse 15, for I am the Lord your God, who stirs up the sea, causing its waves to roar. My name is the Lord of heaven's army. 16, and I have put my words in your mouth and hidden you safely in my hand. I stretched out the sky like a canopy and laid the foundations of the earth. Now, I don't know about you, but when God says something twice, I like to stop and pay attention and figure out what is he talking about. Because this is the second time he said, I stretched out the sky like a canopy. Why, why is it so important to him to emphasize that twice? In the King James, I believe it reads, that I may plant the heavens and lay the foundations of the earth. That's what it says in King James, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I dove into that, and I was a little uh, scared by what I found, that uh, some of the, some great men of God are interpreting this, this 16th verse as. They're saying, God says, with humanity, I am seeding all of the cosmos with humanity. I'm giving all of the cosmos, uh, I'm giving humanity access to all of the cosmos. And he said, their foundation will be earth. My people will have the foundation of earth. And this is getting a little too deep, and I'm going to save it for part three. Um, whatever it was we were talking about before. But it, 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 it just gets, gets mind-blowing to see what God has prepared and planned for us. And we're just scraping the surface. Our eyes are only just beginning to see a little bit of what God is about to do with us. Because God says it's time for us to wake up. We've been asleep up until now. Uh, some of, sometimes, you know, when you, you're waking up, you can hear things going on in the distance. Those who are awake, moving, doing other things. But you can't really always respond. You, you, because you're still half asleep and, you're, and you, your, your mind is still seemingly someplace else. But God's saying, now it's time to wake up and become fully alert as to who you really are. Become fully alert to your strength, to your power, to your authority. Verse 16, continue. I am the one who says to Israel, you are my people. You are my people. That reminded me of the verse in Isaiah 43, 1, it says, But now, thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. I know I've told this story once or twice before. I'm not sure I told it on a Sunday morning, but however, you're going to hear it again. There was a boy who went on vacation with his parents to the shore. He had built a little boat that he wanted to float in the ocean to see how well it worked. And it, it was to his amazement, uh, it worked pretty well. But when the tide went out, it took his little boat out with it. So this little boat goes out to sea, and he's really upset that he made this boat, and now it's lost forever in the sea. So he goes home, they, they go to bed, he wake up in the morning, he wants to get out to the, the, the beach again, and uh, as they're walking along the boardwalk, this guy has a table set up, the things he's crafts he's made from driftwood. And he's selling it there. And on his table, he sees his boat. The little boy sees his boat. Mom, that's my boat. He goes up to the guy and says, that's my boat. He said, it's not your boat. He said, yes, it is. I made it. That's my boat. He said, no, it's not your boat. I found this on the rocks as I scavenge for wood, as I do it early in the early mornings every morning. He said, now it's mine. He said, but I'll sell it to you. And the little boy <laughs> said, OK. And he's reaching in his pocket. And the guy said, how much you got? And the guy. The kid comes up with about a dollar ninety-eight cents, and he said, "All right, that's enough. Here, you can have it." And the little boy walks away, caressing his little boat, and he says to his boat, "You're mine twice. <laughs> I created you, and now I bought you." That's what God is saying to His people. He said, I love you so much. I created you. And even though you got lost and somebody else found you, he said, I'm buying you back because I love you just that much. So you're mine twice. I created you and I bought you back. Isaiah, here in the 51st chapter, end of the 60 verses, you are my people. 
Now, verse 17 says, wake up, wake up, O Jerusalem. See, we start out with the people saying to God, God, you need to wake up. And now God has turned, he's flipped the script. He's turned it back on you. He said, no, no, you need to wake up. Yes. Wake up, wake up, O Jerusalem. You have drunk the cup of the Lord's fury. You have drunk the cup of terror, tipping out its last drops. Not one of your children is left alive to take your hand and guide you. These two calamities have fallen on you. Desolation and destruction, famine and war. And who is left to sympathize with you? Who is left to comfort you? For your children have fainted and lie in the streets, helpless as antelopes caught in a net. The Lord has poured out his fury. God has rebuked them. But now listen to this, you affected ones, affected ones, who sit in a drunken stupor, though not from drinking wine. This is what the sovereign Lord your God and Defender says, See, I have taken this terrible cup from your hands. I will drink no more of my fury. You will drink no more of my fury. Instead, I will hand that cup to your tormentors, those who said, We will trample you into the dust and walk on your backs. Verse 17 again says, Wake up, wake up, O Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. And it's, it's kind of funny how it worked. Since its inception, since the beginning, Jerusalem has always been about 10% of the population of Israel. And I said, you know, let me look that up. So th this morning, I said, to see if that's still true. I looked up this morning the population of Israel, and I looked up the population of Jerusalem. The population of Israel is 9,118,000 people. Jeez. The population of Jerusalem is 918,000 people. 10% wow. of Israel is in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. But God loves Israel, and so God has made Jerusalem the capital of his kingdom when he comes to the earth. God is saying to his capital, to his people who are most precious, the tithe, the remnant of his people, he said, you have to wake up. We all know 2 Chronicles 7, 14. It says, if the Democratic Party, no, it says, if the majority of folks if the Republicans, no. if the rich, no. if the white man, no. the black man, no. the Indian chief. No. <laughs> no, it says, if my people, doesn't matter how many you are, he said, if my people, yes. and there's something about the tithe, God loves the tithes. If you bring your tithes, he said, God will overflow you with abundance. He'll open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you may not have any room enough to receive. How much is a tithe, someone says? Is it $10? Is it $100? No, it's 10% of whatever your increase is. And God said he'll pour out his abundance on you for just giving 10% of whatever it is you have. Here, if we, 10% of the population, would come together and cry out to God and repent of our misdeeds, of our stepping, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. There's some wicked ways still in the house of the Lord that needs to be removed. And, and here he is, he's telling the people, oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem. He said, I know you've gone through. I know you've suffered right along with the rest of the country. I know your sons and daughters have not been spared from the violence in our city. But he said, it's now, oh, Jerusalem, oh, the remnant, oh, people of God, it's time for you to step up. And he said, now I'm going to take this cup, this terrible, bitter cup. I know some of you have lost sons and daughters, or you know have relatives or people that have lost sons and daughters. And it's been horrible. It's heart-wrenching. And it's not the way God wants us to live. He wants us to live in bliss. He wants us to live in joy and abundance of life. He said, I'm going to take this terrible cup from your hands, and I'm going to give it to your enemies. And when I saw in verse 23, it says, instead, I will hand that cup to your tormentors. I thought of Isaiah 61, verse 3, where it says, to give beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, 
the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. God says, I'm going to give you the instead. It's the time of the instead. Instead of the horror that you've been going through, God says, I'm going to pour out blessings. Instead of the ashes, I'm giving you beauty. Instead of uh, misery, I'm giving you gladness. We will trample those who threaten to trample you into the dust and walk in your backs. I've heard some inside information about some of the things that they, you know who they are, the evil they, are planning. Uh, they're pr purposely trying to bring down the nation, the United States. They're, they're perpetrating the hate for this nation to bring it down, to humble it, to bring it to our knees. And one way to do it is to break the back of small business owners. So they're trying to shut them down and, and let the, the big businesses run the, the nation. Those who have the money and the power and the prestige, they want to let them keep it and, and keep the, the other people suppressed. Uh, and so that they can command and demand what everyone does. That's not the American way. And we here in Philadelphia, I don't know that we're a tenth of the nation, but in the surrounding boroughs, maybe in the Delaware Valley, we make up a tenth of the, the nation. We can decide. We need to stand up and declare yeah. this far and no further. Yeah. We, we put up with your foolishness for this long, but no longer. No longer will we bow the knee to your, your mandates and your dictates. Yeah. Because our Constitution said we the people. We are the one who give power. We have been ordained by God. We have been empowered by God to establish a government. Not the government being ordained by God. No, they, we establish the government. We the people. And God is saying it's now time for us to stand up and give voice to what we know is right. Make declarations. But I continue on. I go right across the uh, chapter barrier there into the 52nd chapter of Isaiah. And I don't know what it says in your Bible, but my Bible had a little heading for this chapter. It says, Deliverance for Jerusalem. Right. Deliverance for Jerusalem. I don't know if you've ever heard this before, but this is the hour of deliverance. Yes. And deliverance <laughs> is taking the land. Yes. We cannot move forward. We cannot become what God would have us to be until we ourselves are delivered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God is saying, I'm delivering my people first and foremost. I'm removing the distraction. They can't look forward because they're constantly distracted by sickness, yeah. by disease, by issues, by aches and pains, by memories, by relationships, by lack of funding. God says, I'm removing them. I'm delivering them from everything that is hindering them from doing what I uh, sign their hands to do. So he starts out this this chapter, chapter 52. Wake up, wake up, O Zion. Yes. Wait, before he said, wake up, wake up, O Jerusalem. Did you know Zion is a mountain in Jerusalem? And about 1% or 10% of the population of Jerusalem lives in that area. Talking another time now. So 1% of the nation lives in Mount Zion. Now God is speaking specifically to Mount Zion. He's saying, wake up, wake up, O Zion. Clothe yourself with strength. Wait, the people pray, God, put on your strength. Now God is saying, no, no, you put on your strength. I'm talking specifically to this 1%. You know, we got people marching in the street, down with the one percenters. You are the one percenters. You that have remained faithful to God. Despite what was going on, despite what you see going on, despite though it seemed like God was not hearing, God was not delivering on the promises he made to you, you still held on, held on and held out. Like Job, Job said, I don't understand what is happening to me. I've been faithful, I've been righteous, I've been making sacrifices for my sins and the sins of my children. And all of this has befallen me. He said, I have a case to take before the Lord God. But after a while, and, and, and all of his friends tried to persuade him, and his wife even said, uh, Job, why don't you just go ahead and curse God and die? Job said, no, no. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He said, I came into the world with nothing. I'll leave with nothing. It's all right with me. He said, my witness is in heaven and my record is on high. All of my appointed time will I wait. That's yes, what Job yes. said. Yes. 
I don't know how long this is going to be. I'm just going to continue to do what I know is right. And so there are many of you today that I know that despite what the government has told you you could or couldn't do, you still cried out to, to God. Uh, the government told you you couldn't assemble, you couldn't do this, you couldn't, you couldn't sing in church. I heard that in one city. You couldn't sing. But like Daniel, you went to your window and Nebuchadnezzar said you can no longer pray. He went just like he always did, opened his windows wide and he cried out to the God of the universe. He didn't allow any government ordinance telling what he could or could not do. Right. And God is saying, I'm addressing you. He said, I, I address Jerusalem. Jerusalem has allowed all kinds of corruption. And I, I, I'm equating Jerusalem with the church, the church as a whole. And they've allowed corruption, they've allowed, allowed the world to get into the church. Mm -hmm. yeah. My dad would always say, it's a great thing for the Titanic to be in the ocean. But it's a terrible thing when the ocean gets in the Titanic. I heard someone say just the other day, he said, yeah, God uh, took the children of Israel out of Egypt. But Egypt was still in the children of Israel. Many of us have been free, not you personally, but your ancestors, our ancestors, my ancestors were slaves. And they were taken out of slavery. But slavery wasn't taken out of them. And even to this day, we still see people today with a slave mentality. I can do no more than the master allows me to do. God says, I'm setting you free. I'm delivering. I'm delivering the church. But he says, it's going to come through Zion. We studied, when we studied the courts of heaven, we talked about the mountains. Mountains represent authority. Mountains represent power. Uh, mountains represent government. Uh, and specifically, it said, as we study the, the courts of heaven, it said how Mount Zion represents the government of God. Okay, so Jerusalem is the capital city. Mount Zion is the government. Mount Zion is the uh, legislative body. Mount Zion is the supreme court. That's where the law of the land is made. That's where the law of the land is, is set down. I didn't even get through verse 1 yet again, did I? Uh, wake up, wake up, O Zion. Clothe yourself in strength. Put on your beautiful clothes, O city of Jerusalem. For unclean and godless people will enter your gates no longer. God says, I'm putting an end to the infiltration of the worldliness in the church. Because of you have held on, because of you, Zion, you're going to legislate. You're going to be the ones that, 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 that stand at the gate. Verse 2, rise from the dust, O Jerusalem. Sit in a place of honor. Remove the chains of slavery from your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For this is what the Lord says. When I sold you into exile, I received no payment. Now I can redeem you without having to pay for you. All right. Now, what he's saying is he didn't pay any money for you, but it actually did cost him this, the son of Jesus Christ, his son, Jesus Christ. It cost the ultimate price. We've been paid for. We've been bought back. Well, he didn't have to pay the enemy. As I'm reading this, I'm thinking about Joel chapter 2, how it tells us the the, the, the priests and the ministers who cry between the altar and the door that the heathen not reign over us. God says, I'm giving you the authority to stop having the heathen, the ungodly, the spirit of Antichrist to reign and rule in your life. Wake up. Wake up, O Zion. Verse 4, this is what the sovereign Lord says, long ago my people chose to live in Egypt. Wow. They chose to live there. Wow. Now they are oppressed by Assyria. I set them free from Egypt, and now the, their enemies have come upon them again, Assyria. Verse 5, what is this, asked the Lord? Why are my people enslaved again? Those who rule them shout in exultation. My name is blasphemed all day long. Verse 6, but I will reveal my name to my people, and they shall come to know its power. Wow. As I'm reading this, I'm thinking about 1 John 3, 2. He said, now are we the sons of God. But it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But when he shall appear, 
we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And, and I always uh, give the, or define that verse to say that we are the sons of God. But like I said about Juneteenth, those slaves were free on January 1st of 1863, four, three. But because they didn't know it, they weren't free until June 19th, two years later, two and a half years later. We are now the sons of God, but we have, it's not entered into our heart, it's not entered in our spirit, what that means. But God is saying in verse 6, I will reveal my name to my people. He's going to give us an understanding. He's going to give us a revelation. And, and John, 1 John 3 tells us when we get that revelation, we will be just like Jesus in the earth. As he is, so are we in this world. We're going to be just like Jesus. As I keep telling you, Jesus Christ is coming back for a glorious bride. And, and God, being, who, who said uh, to his uh, people in the Old Testament, he said, I don't want you to be unequally yoked. He would not have Jesus marry off to someone who is a whip, little, weak, puny uh, uh, vagabond. Yeah. But he wants Jesus to marry someone who is his equal. Yes. Yes. And God says, I'm giving you in this day, in this hour, in this time, I'm giving you the revelation of who you are. Verse seven. How beautiful are the mount, or How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of the messenger who brings the good news, the good news of peace and salvation, the news that God, that the God of Israel reigns. The good news is the gospel. And here he's saying that the good news is going to be established. Its feet are going to be in the on the mountains. The mountain, we said, was the position of authority. How beautiful is it when the gospel is in the position of authority in the nation? How beautiful is it when the truth, the gospel, the love of Jesus Christ is in authority in the mayor's seat? in the governor's mansion, yeah. in the White House, in the Congress, on the Supreme Court, in traffic court. How beautiful would it be if people weren't in those positions having some kind of agenda, some kind of way of self-aggrandizement, some way to puff themselves up, some way to make their own name great. Wouldn't it be wonderful if people were there just to serve? As they say there, I'm here to serve my people. And yeah, they go in broke and they come out multimillionaires. How is that when you're only making 100000 a year? Something happened. And the roads are still full of potholes. And we still have poverty. And the schools still don't work as they should. And, and, and on and on the list goes. But God says, how beautiful would it be if we had some safe folks in politics? How beautiful would it be if we had people who knew God in positions of authority? Now, I'm not saying that we should make this a, the uh, a theocracy, a, a nation where we command or demand everyone to be Christians. But no, I, I believe that we should not have a, a nation where we allow every, all the satanic folks to run the place. Amen. God is saying it's time for Mount Zion to wake up. Mount Zion, you're responsible for Jerusalem. Get Jerusalem cleared up. Get Jerusalem cleared out. Keep crying out to me. Keep calling upon me. And I will give you the revelation of who you are. And then you'll begin to walk in your authority. I think about, and I know I've said this a few times recently, but it just keeps coming before me. I even shared it with uh, Brother William the other day. Zechariah chapter 3, how... Uh, Zachariah's in court, and I said, you know, it's like the O.J. Simpson trial, except he's got the hat on, and he's got the gloves on, and he's got blood splattered all over him, and he's in court. And they say, you know, and the accuser of the brother is there. He's guilty. Throw him away. Lock, lock him up. And, and, and the judge, God, our father, happens to be the judge, said, wait a minute. He can't go to trial looking like this. Clean him up. Give him some new clothes. 
And he said, then on top of that, now that he's cleaned up, he's got some good clothes. He said, now I want you to wrap his mind in a martyr, a turban, a hat. I want you to change his way of thinking. We talked about that quite extensively the last couple of weeks, how a caterpillar goes to a butterfly. Yeah, that's a big metamorphosis, a big change. But the mind has to change. The caterpillar has to realize it can no longer eat green leaves because it had teeth, but now it just has a straw. Uh, the caterpillar has to realize, uh, the butterfly has to realize that it, it, it can't camouflage among the green leaves anymore. It has to find another way of escape. The caterpillar has to realize all the things. It, it, nutritional uh, requirements are different. It's got a whole different purpose. The, the mature butterfly has to realize now I'm mature. It's time for me to repopulate and replenish the earth. The caterpillar, all his job was to get me to the pupa stage so I can become a butterfly. But now the butterfly says, I have to bring others into this. I have to make others come to where I am. We have to change the way we think. Yes, yes, That's what God says, I'm doing. I'm yes, changing your mind. Yes, yes. Be not conformed to the thing that this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He said, we want you to present your body as a living sacrifice. Let it be holy and acceptable yes. unto God. He said, in this courtroom, so God has cleaned us up, and he said, he put this, this turban on us so that we change the way we're thinking. We were thinking guilty. See, a lot of times, uh, with this whole teaching, there's a whole lot of teaching about the courts of heaven. It's popular now. We go up into the courts of heaven, and then we listen to the accuser, accuser of all these things. And you know what? He's such a smooth talker, and we get to thinking, yeah, he's, he's kind of right, though. I, yeah. Yep, I did lie. Yep, oops, I did accidentally sleep with so-and-so. Yep, oops, I didn't mean to, but, you know. I didn't mean to steal that money, but, you know, it was on their desk for two days. And nobody was touching it. And it looked just like my money. It felt real comfortable in my wallet, so, you know. So... When the devil starts his, his rant on accusing us, we sit there and say, all right, yeah, I'm guilty. And so the judge, to be a fair judge, if the person being accused says, I'm guilty, what choice does he have? Yeah, when I was in the world, I smoked a carton of cigarettes every week. I should have lung cancer and die. Yeah, it's only fair. No, 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 that's the accuser telling you that. The accuser saying, no, no, I don't care what you did in the past because that past is no longer associated with you. It's associated with something else. But you, your past is forgiven. I'm going to say something that might sound a little blasphemous. Sowing and reaping is an elementary principle in the kingdom. I know you hear it on all the big time television and I know my name, nobody knows my name or who I am and who I dare to dare say that. But that's elementary teaching. You give and God gives back. That's elementary. That's low level. God says, I want to take you up to a higher place where abundance is yours. Yes, yes. He said, no, I'm not talking about a sense of entitlement. But I'm talking about a sense of relationship because you're related to me. Yes, yes. Right. We have a joint bank account and here's your debit card. Yeah, I keep putting stuff in there, and whenever you need something, all you got to do is go and get it out. And stop, stop thinking that you have to do something. You're related to me, God says. You accepted me. Wow, talk about amazing grace. Sometimes the grace that we talk about is kind of wimpy. But God says, I want you to step in into the amazing grace. Yeah. Step into my amazing love. You know what agape love is? It's a love, unconditional love. It doesn't matter how you teach me, treat me. I'm going to love you with yeah. everything I have. So it doesn't matter that you messed up a few days ago. God said, just keep coming back to me. I'll keep pouring it on you. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Just keep coming back to me. Yes. Just wake up and say, hi, God. <laughs> I said, all right, I got some great stuff lined up for you today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. How beautiful are the mountains 
On the mountains are the feet of the messengers who bring the good news. The good news of peace and salvation. You want peace in Philadelphia? God says, I'm raising up a government in Philadelphia. Philadelphia will not be lost. It will be the city of brotherly love. It will be a place of on earth as it is in heaven. Why? Because he said, I'm revealing my name to you. I'm making my name great in your mouth. He said, the words that you decree and declare, you shall have them. The angels are waiting for the words that come out of your mouth. You know what? So are the demons. Our words not only empower angels, they also empower demons. Jesus told Peter, he said, upon this rock, upon this truth, upon knowing this, I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail upon those of you that know the truth. God says, I give you authority over the gates of hell. If you agree with the enemy and spring wide open the gates of hell, then, then you'll have hellhounds chasing you all the way till you get to heaven. But he said, but I give you authority to lock it down, to shut it down. God, I'm shutting down this violence in our city. I have authority here. God's saying, you, one percenters. Yeah, that's you, one percenters. The ones that the, they're the per, uh, demonstrating in the street against, the one percenters. Yeah, one percent. God says, it is up to you to cleanse the house and then determine the fate of the nation. The fate of America stands in the hands of the people of God. You see, God says, the heavens are mine, but the earth I've given to the sons of man. So I can't just do whatever I want willy-nilly in the earth unless I have a vessel to throw through, flow through, unless I have a man to operate through. All right, I'm losing it. Come back. <laughs> Let the ruins of Jerusalem break into joyful song, for the Lord has comforted his, his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord hath demonstrated his holy power before the eyes of all nations. All the ends of the earth will see the victory of our God. God said, you've been laughed at and you've been mocked and ridiculed. And maybe rightly so, because you've not been faithful to me. But God said, now is the time. Now is the time I've brought you back. I've redeemed you. I've brushed you off. I've made you clean. I've made you brand new. Let's try this thing again. He said, at this time, it's going to work. This time, we're going to be great. This time. We're going to be a fear and a dread to the nations of the earth. God said, I'm sending my son Jesus back. And he said, I'm looking. And he said, he's going to separate the sheep from the goat nations. And the, the sheep nations are those that will align themselves with the kingdom of God, will align themselves with Israel. And it is up to us to make sure our nation aligns itself with the kingdom of God. So that when Jesus sets up his kingdom on earth, our nation will be among the favored nations of the earth. That's the job of those who live in Mount Zion. Yeah. I love how the Message Bible renders uh, Isaiah 52, verse 10. Isaiah 52, verse 10 in the Message Bible says, God has rolled up his sleeves. All the nations can see his holy muscled arm. Everyone from one end of the earth to the other sees him at work doing his salvation work. God is flexing now. All right, don't let me unleash these guns. It's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. But God says, I'm going to bless my children and whoever harms them. It would be as though they were sticking their finger in the apple of God's eye. Verse 11 says, get out. Get out and leave your captivity. And everything you touch is unclean. Get out of there and purify yourselves. You who carry home the sacred objects of the Lord, you will not leave in a hurry running for your lives, for the Lord will go ahead of you. Yes, the God of Israel will protect you from behind. So what he's saying, there's some stuff that you know that you probably shouldn't be messing with. The Bible says, let us lie aside every weight and every sin that so easily besets us. We should be further down the road, but because of some little stupid thing, because when God says, hey, why don't you get up and pray for a while in the middle of the night, he says, oh, but yeah, I can wait till the sun comes up. Mm -hmm. That little thing, that little thing could prevent us from reaching maturity in Christ. He's not going to cast us out for that. But it can keep us from re 
reaching the, the levels of maturity that he wants to do, the, the, how he wants to reveal the sonship of Jesus Christ in, in, in each of us, how he wants us to demonstrate the power of God in all the earth. The word of God says in Habakkuk, it tells us how uh, there's coming a day when the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. And how is he going to do it? He's going to demonstrate his glory for those who are prepared, those who are ready, glory. the one presenters, you and me. God said, I've chosen you. And now it's time for you to fulfill the, 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 the gift that I've given you, Philadelphia Deliverance Tabernacle. He said, I've called you to prophesy to the city, to, to not just foretell what's going to happen, but to foretell, to make the future happen. Make history yes. or his story. God, see, God has a plan for Philadelphia. Yes. Not just a plan for you, but he's got a plan for Philadelphia. Yes. But it's up to us, the people of God, to fulfill history or his story. Mm -hmm. To fulfill his plan, he needs his people. Oh, yeah. yes. Yes. So God says, let go of those, those things, whatever they are. Yes. Whatever they are. Eating too much. Sleeping too much. I don't know. TV too much. Whatever it is. God says, you know what they are. And if you don't know, ask the Holy Spirit. Is the Holy Spirit, is there anything in my life? Sin, number one. I would need to get rid of those. But number two, there are things that aren't necessarily sin, but are a weight. Yeah. They're preventing me. I could run faster. I don't know if you watch any of the Olympics, but you never saw any of the runners with like fur coats on and mittens. Yeah. <laughs> it's just weight they don't need. It's not a sin. It's not a crime. It's not a, a, against Olympic committee rules. They can certainly wear a fur coat if they want to. <laughs> but they don't for some strange reason. And God is saying the same thing. There's some things you can't have. Apostle Paul, I believe, says all things are permissible. I can do, you know, I'm free in Christ Jesus. Yes. Everything's permissible. Yeah, I can go to the bars and, and have a good time and laugh with my friends. Yeah. The Bible tells me not to get drunk. I can go to the bar and not get drunk. Mm -hmm. But do I need to be in that atmosphere? Do I need to hear the, the vulgar language? And do I need to hear... Uh, the defeatism and, and the de demonic talk, whether we know it or not, it gets in us, it gets on us. Get out, get out, and leave that your captivity. Leave those things that held you in bondage, where everything you touch is unclean. See, sometimes there's things that we do that is sinful, but God says those there's some things we shouldn't even touch. Uh, yeah. Ephesians chapter 5, it says, For it is a shame to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Yeah. Now, I say, God, I, I probably am guilty of this. I'm always saying, oh, is that terrible what they're doing? Yeah, I, I do it here. Uh, this drag queen reading to our children in the libraries. And I'm uh, constantly talking about that. So God said, you know, it's a shame to even speak of those things yeah. which are done of them in secret. In the early church, when they were going through persecution, most of it, most of the time, 99% of the time, they weren't even saying what the persecution was. But when they gathered together to pray, you would think you would hear what their persecutions were. And we do it. We come together and say, oh, God, the government's doing this, or my job is making me do that. But no, they said, no, 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 God, we just thank you that we were, you accounted us worthy to go through. They didn't say what it was specifically that they were going through. But he said, God, but give us more boldness. Yeah. We're going through this because we talk about you. And they didn't say, you know, make them stop beating us up for talking about you. But they said, give us more boldness so we won't be afraid at the backlash. Whatever it is they have for us, we're going to be bold to declare the things of God. And it said, and the church grew daily, such as should be saved. Yeah. 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 Oh, amen. All right. My time is up. Thank you, Lord. So our Bible, as we know, uh, wasn't written in chapters and verses. That was added much later. And I think the chapter should have ended there. But it goes on. Uh, to talk about Jesus Christ, the suffering servant, which is seems to be part of chapter 53. I'm just going to read to the end of the chapter 52. The Lord's suffering servant. See, my servant will prosper. He will be highly exalted. But many were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured, he seemed hardly human. 
and from his appearance, one would scarcely know he was a man. And he will startle many nations. Kings will stand speechless in his presence, for they will see what they have done, what they have not been told, and they will understand what they have not heard about. I just read to the end because of verse 15. It says, Jesus is going to come back yes. and he's going to establish his kingdom. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. And the powers that be, they thought they knew it all. They thought they had the perfect plan. They thought they had the world system beat. They had all the money. They had all the power. They had everything and anything they wanted. They had the biggest homes, the finest cars, the best jets. Anything they wanted to do, they could do. They thought they were so great. But then when they see Jesus comes, mm. their mouths are going to drop open and they'll become speechless. And the, the last two lines of that verse is, for they will see what they had not been told. They will see Jesus Christ is even greater than what they'd heard about. Mm -hmm. And it says, and they will understand what they had not heard about. In other words, these mighty kings will understand then that Jesus Christ is king. And I believe that's why then every knee shall bow. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord because when they see him, you know, we're going to get that revelation early. So we're going to be walking like him and talking just like him. But they are going to get this sudden realization that they're going to see him and realize who he is and realize they are on the wrong side. Ouch. That's what I tell Muslims. I said, you tell me you're saved by your goods and your, your good outweighing your bad. I said, do you know if you have more good than bad right now? I hope so. I said, why be surprised on the day of judgment if your good has not been more than your bad? Wouldn't that be terrible? Because you have no nowhere to go then, except to the hot place. I said, why not be assured now? Because see, no, there's a lie out there in the world that says only the good go to heaven and the bad go to hell. No, that's not true. That's not true. There's some good people that you would call good. He gave me $10. He's good. Yeah. yeah, but you don't know his heart. He's in hell now. No, the saved go to heaven and the unsaved go to hell. And so Jesus Christ said, if you come to me, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. What have you done? All you've, come, all you've done is come and believe. If you don't know Jesus Christ, I encourage you to come to Jesus today. Accept him as the Lord of your life and, and just, just say that his work on the cross is enough to forgive you of your sins. And then ask him to be the Lord of your life. And you're saved. Your eternal destination has now been changed. You're now a saved person. What do you say from your soul? It's saved from an eternity in hell. But don't stop your prayer there. Ask Jesus to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Ask him to give you the gift of speaking in other tongues that you can edify yourself, that you'll build your faith up in the most, build yourself up in the most holy faith so that you will accelerate your growth process, that, so that you can become a mature son much faster than you otherwise would. It's the Holy Spirit that takes you into the supernatural realm and uh, causes you to become the superman and superwoman of God. Ask him to fill you with his spirit. Amen. And you can be one, part of the one percenters. Doesn't matter what your bank account says. Yeah. Doesn't matter how many people know your name or how many followers you have on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> but it, the most important thing is your name is written in heaven. Mm -hmm. Amen. And that's the most important thing when it's all said and done. Does Jesus know who I am? This is the hour of deliverance. Yep. And deliverance is taking the land. God bless you. Thank you so much for your time. Shalom until the next time.